International Players Anthem has one of the greatest songs that's ever made. It is the victory lap for an entire region, and it's on their record. Like, the tragedy, of course, is that it comes out after Pimp C dies. But they are that group. The year is 1994, and hip-hop has cemented itself into the mainstream. In this series, we'll be discussing why this year is regarded as one of the greatest years in the history of rap. From New York icons like Nas and Biggie, to the arrival of Southern rap in the form of Outkast or UGK, 94 was one of the biggest years in rap music. We'll look back at these classic albums, sharing why they're so great and why their impact meant so much to the culture. All right, man, let's get to it. So, Bo, I think most people know UGK from their hit International Players Anthem, but who was UGK before Super Tight comes out? All right, so I'd say the Ghetto Boys are the first group from Texas to really go national. The second to really feel big was UGK. And what was different from them was that the Ghetto Boys are from Houston, this big city. UGK is from Port Arthur, a smaller town about an hour and a half east. Now, that worked out well for them because there's some cats on the south side of Houston that couldn't really traffic too easily on the north side, and some cats on the north side that couldn't traffic too easily on the south side. Since they weren't from Houston, they could go anywhere in the city. That's a point that Bum B makes all the time. And so they put out a tape called The Southern Way that's got songs that were produced like when Pimp C was 16 years old. Like, okay, in the back of the ride is 16-year-old Pimp C on the beat, uh, flipping a Curtis Mayfield sample. And that was their introduction regionally or even locally. And that turns into their first album on Jive called Too Hard to Swallow. The first moment really, though, it starts feeling like this goes national after you've had Pocket Full of Stones on the Minister Society soundtrack is with Super Tight when it comes out in 1994. I'm curious to ask you what makes the combination of Bun B and Pimp C work so well. I feel like before you start talking about the two of them as rappers, you kind of have to start with the bedrock of all UGK music, which is Pimp C as a producer. And Bun B always said he had the easiest job in the world is that he just comes in and he raps over Pimp C beats. And so Pimp C as a producer to me is interesting because everybody agrees that he's got dope beats but in a very smooth and steady sort of way. The example I give always is that if you need somebody to do an album, you get Kanye to do the album, but if you need somebody to give you a beat, you go to Just Blaze. Pimp C is the sort of dude that you go to for the album. Not that he didn't have bangers, but it was like his music theory game was always so strong. The ability to work live instrumentation into the stuff that he was doing was always so strong. So that was the first place that you start with is, UGK always had a sound. The sound would evolve and change from album to album, but the bedrock that starts is the Pimp C sound. Then on top of that, you put the two of them as rappers who are almost in their way kind of a Lennon and McCartney combination where McCartney was the guy that gave you the pop jingles almost. The melodies were always so smooth and catchy and everything else. And then the moral of the story kind of came in from Lennon where it was a bit more cutting and to the point of what he had to say. It's not a direct parallel with Pimp C and Bun B, but Bun gave you a level of rapping and rhyming sophistication that was there for those people who call themselves rap purists. You always had Bun B that was kind of in line for that. What you had from Pimp C was an archetype, not a stereotype. It's a point that Bun makes. Pimp C was an archetype, not a stereotype. And if you are from the South, you knew a dude like Pimp C. He was as relatable as any rapper had been. And what you got from him was clarity, crystal clear clarity, unabashed at every word that he ever said. And you knew damn well he meant everything that he ever said. So you put those two things together in whatever angle or whatever song that they were approaching, you had it coming where you could decide which one of them was your guy, but the combination of them was hard to beat. And now let's get to Super Tight, released in 94. Obviously, that's why we're talking about it. But what makes this album so special? So to me, the first track, Return, gives us what is like the co-star of this album. Yeah, the stars are Pimp C and Bum B. But the co-star is this organ. Every now and then, every few tracks here and there, Pimp C clearly was really into the sound of a pipe organ. And the pipe organ is one of the defining characteristics of this record. And I defy you to think of a time that you have listened to a rap song and an organ came in and it did not work. Like it, it works every single time. It's a wonder that you don't hear it on every single song, but the organ works every time. And the organ to me is one of the defining characteristics of this album. Like I've got friends that'll talk about like as they went down the line, but like, damn, I miss what Pimp was putting the organ on the tracks. 
That's one thing that you have here. The other thing that you have is a classic freshman to sophomore leap. Now, the sophomore to junior leap into riding dirty may have been even bigger than that. But you have that classic leap on this one where these dudes showed you something and they had a thing going on the first album and they refined it and clearly got a whole lot better on the second album. The other thing that is a defining characteristic of UGK Records is this is gangster rap with sing-songy hooks at all times, at a time where not everybody really had a mastery of that. It's a thing that Pimp C was always good at. It's in line with his theory game, always being so strong. So that's the next thing that you get there. The third thing that you get is it is a range of things and places that they're willing to go on this. So yeah, a lot of it is talking about how dope your ride is. A lot of it is lifestyle type stuff. You kind of get in somewhat early on some of the luxury elements of rap. Like that Don Perry yawn is supposed to bubble. Like that's a, that is cutting edge stuff for 1994 for everybody who did it. Keeping in mind, this album came out the month before Ready to Die, right? So when you start talking about Biggie getting in and talking about some of those things, it's a UGK record that talks about that before you've got this their version of fuck the police basically and protect and serve you've got the feds in town it is a day in the life of dope dealing port arthur i think it's probably the easiest way to sum this up that is what you get here but also with a nod to the sensibilities of hip-hop in other places because at this time there's not a lot of southern hip-hop for these dudes to draw off of so you've got bum b who is a clear krs1 disciple and so you've got those kind of east coast elements in there plus a lot of the west coast elements especially production wise coming into the record and so texas kind of becomes a, a place where the two coasts come together and this album i think is one where it feels that way keeping in mind the middle of the map has not really been filled in in 1994 in the way that it would be later. So Bo, favorite tracks on Super Tight? My favorite track on it is actually not on it. My favorite track on it is Front Back Side to Side, but not the version that's on this album, which is very good, but the version that's on the Low Down Dirty Shame soundtrack, which is actually the clean version, but it's got an extra verse in there that Pimp and Bun go back and forth. And it's got the, if these switches keep on burning and these tires keep on turning, I'd be coming down your street, flashing green, freaks be yearning. Not on the album. Really wish it would have been. Anyway, Return with the organ is great. It's supposed to bubble. Love it. I left it wet for you, which has got such a dope beat. And, you know, a little crass, but I understand what the message is. It gets there. Uh, Pocket Full of Stones Part 2 is a winner. Protect and Serve is like, if you ever listen to Fuck the Police and you said to yourself, wow, I don't think those guys went far enough. Protect and Serve is for you. They managed to take it a step further that you may not have even thought was possible. Uh, Stone Junkie is a good one. 316s is the one that wraps up the album. And it's interesting because I always listened to it and I felt like the point of 316s was almost for anybody that said they could not rap to show that they could rap, to show that they, like the beat has a bit more, I would say a bit more, though not entirely of kind of an East Coast sensibility to it. Like in case you think we just down here being country, we could also do the same things that y'all do. I did an interview once with Bub B and he talked about how Leo Nocentelli of the Meters guitar player is on Super Tight. And how did he wind up on Super Tight? Because Pimp C just sat up one day and called the guitar player from the Meters and said, hey, you want to come down here and play on the album? And he said, sure, I'll come play on the album. Like, if you want to know who Pimp C is, Pimp C is the dude who at 21 years old just gets on the phone and calls the dude from the Meters because the worst he could do is say no. There's not a bad track on here that i can say with confidence there's not a bad track on this album coming off of super tight what is the critical reception of ugk where are they in the world of rap this to me is where the ugk is the most underrated group in rap starts to get its genesis is at this point because look without a great deal of promotion this album sold almost four hundred thousand copies right like it, it was a very if you know you know sort of project which in large part was the design because a lot of their their strategy for promotion was doubling down on core fans doing a lot of shows in a lot of places that did not have dots on the map like if you were from a small town there's a good chance that ugk was your favorite rap group because they were the rap group that came and did a show in your small town they had that locked up on top of that they had earned a level of respect within the industry from the people who knew and something that becomes very important a respect from people in the streets who understood what it was that they were talking about. So they became like almost a test of how deep into rap or how deep in the game you were it was about how you felt 
about these dudes and these guys. Keep in mind, Riding Dirty, the next album, went gold without a single or a video. Like the people who love them and knew them, it starts here, right? That is when they develop this rock solid reputation in rap and it starts on this album. Obviously, Pimp C passes away, but what is the lasting legacy of UGK? I mean, to me, outside of Outkast, UGK is the greatest group that the South has ever produced. They have one of the more enduring catalogs ever. Um, International Players Anthem has one of the greatest songs that's ever made. It is the victory lap for an entire region, and it's on their record. Like The tragedy, of course, is that it comes out after Pimp C dies. But they are that group. You're not going to find a lot of people who have something bad to say about UGK because the way they kicked it was so based around respect that what was there for you not to like? They are Hall of Fame rappers. And now Bun B has basically become the hip hop mayor of Houston, right? Like when it comes time for something to go down in Houston, you can't do it without Bun B. The idea that they can sell out the rodeo with these rap shows in the ways that they have. This all comes from the legacy of Pimp C and Bum B and the decade and change of albums that they put out. And the fact that those records endure is what has made everything that Bun's been able to do afterward. It builds off of that. 